Hey folks, Jeff Hirsch here with another Lightroom video for you. Adobe has just released Lightroom Classic version 13, and in this video we'll look at all the new features and tweaks in the latest major release. Like all Lightroom Classic updates, version 13 includes support for new cameras and lenses, a slew of bug fixes and performance improvements, along with a couple of new features. While this new version isn't quite as earth-shaking as the masking system we got in the two previous major releases, it's still got some useful and worthwhile new features I want to tell you about. Let's start with the smaller stuff and get that out of the way before we turn our attention to a couple of major new features that Adobe has added to Lightroom Classic in version 13. First up, the requirements to run version 13. Adobe has dropped support for macOS Big Sur, aka macOS 11, the minimum macOS version supported is now macOS Monterey, aka macOS 12. Likewise, they have dropped support for Windows 10 version 20H2, 21H1, and 21H2. The minimum Windows version supported is now Windows 10 version 22H2 or Windows 11 version 21H2 or later. Next, let's talk about the catalog upgrade. Like all major version updates, on first launch, your Lightroom Classic version 12 or older catalog will be upgraded to work with the new version 13. Your old catalog will be preserved as is in case you ever need it in the future, but your preview cache will be migrated to the new catalog. With Lightroom 13, Adobe is moving the models that are used for Select Object and Select People Mask AI to what they're calling a deferred download experience. What this means is that these models would not be a part of Lightroom Classic by default. Instead, they get downloaded from Adobe's servers when you launch Lightroom Classic. If the models haven't been downloaded yet, and you try to do a select object or select people mask, you'll get this message saying some masking models are downloading, please try again later. Now, to make this as seamless as possible for users, Starting with Lightroom Classic version 12.4, Adobe began quietly copying all of these AI masking models to the folder where they eventually would get downloaded. So anyone who has used Lightroom Classic 12.4 or later should have those models already available outside the app and no download would be needed unless and until those models get updated to newer versions. Now let's look at some of the smaller improvements to the program. In the develop module, if you hover over any history step or snapshot, a live preview of that step or snapshot will be shown in the develop loop view. Lightroom Classic 13 also includes some performance tweaks. The newest version has faster image loading in the develop loop view and during normal or fast or turbo walking through your pictures, even with random image selection if you jump back and forth. Adobe has also added the ability to filter presets and preset groups based on the name in the presets panel. We already have this filter mechanism in folders and collections and keywords, and now we have it with presets as well. This can be very helpful if you have a large number of presets or you have many similarly named ones. With Lightroom Classic version 13, Adobe has also improved the performance of metadata operations when you're developing. You should experience faster response in writing and reading XMP files because they've changed the conditions under which XMP data gets written when you're in the develop module. Previously, each edit you made to an image would cause the XMP sidecar to be saved, which caused frequent disk writes. Now the XMP data is only saved when you do one of the following actions. If you change the active image, switch to another module, send the Lightroom Classic app to the background, or quit the Lightroom Classic application. Otherwise, any changes you make get held until you move to the next image, and only then does the XMP file get updated and written to disk. This is much more efficient. 
Next, let's talk about improvements in the library module. Adobe has improved the stability and the performance of folder move operations. You should experience better performance in folder movement between different volumes. This is a most welcome improvement. Similarly, Adobe has improved the stability and the performance of folder delete operations. Adobe has also improved the performance of the convert to DNG function, but they do note that if you do choose a lossy compression in your DNG files, which I do not recommend, it will be in fact slower due to the fact that they're using a newer JPEG XL based compression instead of the older JPEG standard. With all those smaller features and updates out of the way, let's talk about the new features in the latest update. First up is Lens Blur. Adobe has added a Lens Blur feature to Lightroom Classic version 13. This allows you to add the kind of blur which is typically seen in images taken with lenses that have a very wide aperture or short depth of field. You can now effectively blur both foreground and background of an image, and it works on all image formats, not just raw files. If you've ever played with the Depth Blur Neural Filter in Photoshop, this feature should feel familiar to you. The Lens Blur function is based on working with something called depth maps, which divide your image into near and far regions according to the distance from your camera's sensor. They tell the program how near or far these regions are, and they allow you to blur those regions selectively. Because of this, Lens Blur works best on images with a clearly defined foreground, subject, and background area. If you're working with HEIC format files taken in portrait mode on one of the recent model iPhones with multiple cameras, then this depth information is already included with the file and Lightroom can optionally use that information to figure out how far away things are in the image. This can be accessed via the small three dots menu where you have an option to use device depth. For any other kind of photo where that depth map isn't baked into the file, it will be calculated for you using Adobe's Sensei AI system. Let's take a look at the lens blur panel in more detail. When you apply lens blur to an image by checking the little box at the top of the lens blur section, Lightroom will analyze your image, select the subject for you automatically, and apply a default blur amount of 50 to the background areas. You can increase or decrease the amount of blurring using the amount slider. There's a graph in the middle there that shows you which areas have been selected for focus and blurring. The regions inside the little box will be in focus and the regions outside that range will be blurred. You can move the focal region nearer or farther away in the image by clicking and dragging inside that box. And you can adjust the range of depth being affected using the little handles on either end of that box, making the depth of field shallower or deeper. You can also select the focus region using the picker icon and then clicking in the focal range area you wish to spotlight. Clicking on the little subject icon will make the subject be in focus again. Focal range values are shown as numbers on top of the focal range graph and the scale goes from 1 to 100. If you click the box that says visualize depth, you'll get a colored overlay that shows you which areas are in or out of focus using a cool to warm color scale to indicate depth. In focus areas appear as white in the overlay. Nearer regions are colored with warmer colors and farther regions are colored with cooler colors. As you slide the focal range back and forth on the graph, you can actually see where the white in focus areas are within your image. That's the basic operation. Now let's dig a little deeper into the other controls in this panel. If you open up the bokeh section using the little twirler triangle, you'll be able to choose the shape of the blur or bokeh that appears in the background. You have five different options to choose from. The first is a circle, which 
mimics the look of a modern circular lens, but you also have options for a bubble, which is basically a standard circular shape with an overcorrected spherical aberration. There's a five blade or pentagonal shape, which you'll commonly see in vintage lenses. There's a ring or donut shape to the bokeh, which is commonly seen in those reflex or mirror lenses. And finally, there's a cat eye shape, which is typically caused by optical vignetting you might see in certain lenses. I usually keep it on the circle for my shape. There's also a boost slider that will increase or decrease the highlights in the blurred area. If you open up the refine section in the lower half of the lens blur tool, you'll be able to refine the depth mapping even further by brushing over an area to bring it into focus or to add a blurring effect. You'll notice in the example image here that on one side, some of the background has been kept in focus, and on the other side, some of the foreground is missing and has been blurred out. We can fix this using the brush tool in the refine section to paint over the areas that we wish to either be blurred or in focus. Finally, if you hold down the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on a Windows computer, you'll have the option to reset the Lens Blur panel, which can be used to reset all of the blur settings, including the depth map and refinement-related settings. A couple of notes or caveats as you begin to work with this tool. The Lens Blur tool is something Adobe is referring to as an early access build. It's considered a work-in-progress feature and, as such, is still under development. I've noticed that more and more companies are adding early access or beta or pre-release features into their apps as part of a newer trend where users are encouraged to help the makers refine these tools on the way to a more official release. For example, the Photoshop beta release that came out in the spring included the new generative fill features that eventually found their way into the official release of Photoshop in mid-September. There's an option at the bottom of the pane that says click here to share feedback on lens blur. Clicking on this will allow you to send a report to Adobe letting them know how well the lens blur worked for you. They will use your feedback to improve that feature. And then the second caveat is that develop presets, copying and pasting of settings, and syncing or auto-syncing of settings are not supported with lens blur. So there's no way to sync the adjustment between your images, and you'll have to do each one individually. The next new feature Adobe has added to Lightroom version 13 is something they are calling point color. The existing HSL color panel has been replaced with a new color mixer panel. And the color mixer panel has two tabs. There's the mixer tab, which has the traditional HSL and color settings you should be familiar with from your existing Lightroom installations. And then there's the new tab for point color. And point color is this new color editing tool, and it actually works independently from the HSL color controls you'll find in the mixer tab. What point color does is it allows you to sample a color in all three dimensions of hue, saturation, and luminance, and to alter or shift that color in all three dimensions. By contrast, the existing HSL mixer that we've had for many years allows those edits to be made in the three dimensions of hue, saturation, and luminance, but your input color is only in one dimension, and that's hue. For example, by using the point color tool, you can now select and edit a darker skin tone differently than you might a lighter skin tone. Point color samples can also be stacked or overlapped with each other. So in other words, you can make an adjustment to a color and then add a second sample that makes an additional adjustment on top of that. Let's say you've decided to remove some red undertones from the skin and you've made that skin more uniform. You can then sample the overall skin tone you've produced and make an adjustment to that because the first sample brought those red tones to be more even with the overall tone, 
the second sample can then adjust those already adjusted colors along with the ones that were there in the first place. It's a lovely refinement for color control. Point color is available both as a global edit setting and as a local setting within the masking tools. To use the point color, use the picker or selector to select a color you wish to work with. Once the input color is selected, a color swatch is created right next to the picker. You can then change the existing color to a different color within the given range using the sliders for shifting its hue, saturation, and luminance. You can also control the range of the input color to be affected using the range slider for overall range control, or you can in individually select ranges for hue, saturation, or luminance. You can use the Visualize Range checkbox to enable or disable visualization of those affected areas. This can help in adjusting the range within which the affected areas are going to be changed. You can create a maximum of eight color swatches on an image, and you can right-click or control-click on any color swatch and select the option to delete it if you'd like to get rid of it. As always, double-click on any of the individual settings to reset the corresponding setting. I'm excited to try out this new point color tool on my images. It promises to give us even greater control over how colors are rendered in our photos. The last new feature I want to tell you about is HDR output. Lightroom Classic version 13 now offers high dynamic range output. With this, you have the ability to view and edit HDR images if you have a compatible HDR display. This is another early access feature, which means that it's still under development and not yet finalized. And as such, we won't be devoting too much time to it in this video as A, it's unfinished, and B, most photographers aren't yet viewing their images on HDR displays. High dynamic range or HDR displays offer greater brightness and contrast than standard dynamic range or SDR displays. Images optimized for HDR displays will have brighter highlights and more detailed shadows, resulting in an increased sense of realism and greater impact. Although Lightroom Classic offers what sound like similar or related HDR features, such as merge to HDR, the rendered results have always been limited to standard dynamic range output and display. This changes with Lightroom Classic 13, where you will be able to view the HDR results in an HDR output mode if you have a proper HDR display. Most options in the edit panel work similarly in standard dynamic and high dynamic range modes. However, they may need different settings for optimal appearance. HDR processing requires process version 3 or later. A few notes about how HDR display is handled in Lightroom Classic version 13. Lightroom Classic supports the display of HDR content in the main develop loop view only. This does include side-by-side -side and split views, but Lightroom Classic currently does not support HDR display in the film strip, thumbnails, grid, or other image views in any other module or any other dialogues that would display image content, such as merge to HDR, merge to panorama, or enhanced dialogues. If the option to use graphics processor is set to off in the preferences dialog, you can continue to edit HDR images but the result will not be displayed correctly within the develop loop view. This does require your graphics processor support this feature. That's about all I have to say about the new HDR display and output features for now. As this kind of imaging becomes more widespread and more users are equipped with HDR displays that take advantage of it, we'll revisit the topic in more detail in a future video. So that's everything you need to know about the brand new Lightroom Classic version 13 release. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below this video or send me an email. 
For more Lightroom and Photoshop videos, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and go ahead and click the bell icon to get notified anytime I post a new video. And if you aren't already on my mailing list, head over to jeffhirsch.com and sign up for the mailing list and you'll get updates on my classes and workshops and trips along with bonus tutorial videos and articles for Photoshop and Lightroom. I promise not to spam your inbox and I will never ever sell your address to a third party. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.